I'm going to introduce to you Sharon Terry. Sharon, <laughs> yeah. Sharon Terry's been a friend for a long time. She represents PXE because her children were diagnosed with PXE long ago, but also an umbrella organization, an organization called Genetic Alliance that involves all rare diseases and creates all of us as a family together. Sharon has been instrumental in developing tools to move the field forward in rare disease, and so I welcome Sharon and thank her for coming. Thanks very much. So I want to thank uh, Larry and, and all the organizers and all the excellent uh, uh, people who have been putting this together. I know how it is to put together meetings, and this is a really well-run one. Um, I also want to um, thank Larry and the people who, who planned this meeting for their vision uh, for such an eclectic mixture of speakers. It, it certainly is the most interesting mix in any of the places I have ever spoken. And I think you know we've seen everything from really good science to really passionate art, and that's a pretty phenomenal meeting. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about rare diseases, and of course, uh, I changed my title as well, um, <laughs> only, uh, only this morning, uh, to really understand where we're going to fit a rare disease paradigm and the kinds of things we've been talking about, and also how we're going to support those things as we move forward. My two children, Elizabeth and Ian, were diagnosed with pseudoxanthoma elasticum, and PXE means never having to say pseudoxanthoma elasticum, so I will say PXE after this. Uh, they were diagnosed in 1994, and here's a picture of them then, and I should tell you that I do have their informed consent, and I, I pay them royalties for the use of their photos. <laughs> here's what they look like now. Uh, two photographs taken by Rick Widati at a PXE meeting a couple years ago. They're happy kids. Uh, my daughter just applied for and got uh, to be the executive director of the PXE International Foundation at age 23. Having just graduated from college, she believes she should give back to the foundation at least for a couple of years in an almost kind of Peace Corps way for herself. A little bit about my background and why I can talk about the things that I think I can talk about, and that is because the kids were diagnosed um, on, in 1994, two days before Christmas, um, not the kind of thing that you want to receive in terms of news right before uh, Christmas. Uh, having for two years gone through a, what they call the diagnostic odyssey, and it's much, much longer for many diseases, we tried to get them diagnosed. We, uh, follow these little dots on my daughter's neck that did not go away, and our pediatrician kept saying, that's laundry detergent, that's a rash, that's heat, that's cold, whatever. Uh, finally, um, after she recommended that I go to therapy because I was insane about these dots, I did go out of plan, out of pocket. I did go to therapy, which was great. Um, but <laughs> and I was in therapy when they were diagnosed, which was even greater. Um, but I went out of plan, out of pocket to a dermatologist who identified pseudoxanthoma elasticum. And all I heard was oma, and all I knew were lymphoma and all the omas and thought they were uh, facing cancer. He glanced at my son and said, he has it too. It turned out this particular dermatologist had trained as an ophthalmologist and then turned to dermatology when he met his wife. Um, he, the, the disease has a really um, severe morbidity around the eyes um, and, and that uh, people lose their vision around age 30 or 40. So a lot to, to digest, digest, digest with a seven-year-old and a, and a five-year-old and um, a really, as my kids would say, fabulous Christmas. Uh, we had the Toys R Us truck back up to the house. They got everything they wanted. Um, but for us, for Pat and I, it was really looking at how do we cope with this. Um, I was a college chaplain. My master's is in religious studies. My husband went to a trade high school and had a drafting degree and was building the infrastructure for biotech in Boston, but he was putting in the sprinkler systems and HVAC and stuff like that. We were fortunate because we lived in the Boston area, and it's a pretty much a medical mecca, that we could get involved right away with um, research on the condition. And so two days after Christmas, somebody came to our house and took our kids' blood and our blood with no informed consent, which was interesting, we had, but we had no idea, and we were desperate, so we said absolutely. And two days after that, another uh, uh, physician called, physician scientist called from Mount Sinai Hospital in New York and said, we want your kid's blood and your blood, and I said, go get it from that guy at Harvard, and then he laughed uproariously and said, no one shares anything like that, I have to come and take blood again from these little kids. That kind of was a real wake up. So now we're, you know, four or five days past diagnosis. It turns out the dermatologist that diagnosed them lived two houses away. We we're able to get together with him and say, what do we know? What do we do? Why can't we just walk into a doctor's office and have this disease taken care of? It's the question every single person with a rare disease and a common disease asks, and we expect to be taken care of. 
We quickly learned we were not going to be taken care of. There was no deli line. We couldn't pick a number and hope they would get to us. Um, instead, we were going to have to do something. So we called the guys at Harvard and said, can we wash your test tubes, not knowing that you don't have test tubes in PCR. Um, but we began to work with them uh, between 10 p.m. and 4 or 5 in the morning. Uh, neighbors watched our kids, and we began to look for the gene. My husband is dyslexic. And because he's dyslexic, he could see as we started to score these gels and put together these Excel spreadsheets in the old days uh, that, in fact, the locus was 16P13.1 um, uh, and that we were seeing the gene and we found the gene. We were co-inventors of the gene, and so we, um, we hold uh, the patent, which we gave to our foundation, and so did all the scientists who worked with us. We were also very interested in the fact that we were having to invent wheels left and right, and we knew that actually all these things must have already happened for a lot of diseases. Certainly not enough diseases, but some diseases. And so we connected with Genetic Alliance, which is an umbrella organization that I'll talk a little bit about, and they began to teach us some of the things that other groups had learned. But we also realized that in some ways, some of those groups had been uh, somewhat timid, and we um, weren't going to be timid because we really saw the future of our kids' eyesight and a lot of other people's uh, kind of uh, uh, quality of life at stake. Um, we formed a, a blood and tissue bank for the disease, but at the same time we started to make it cross-platform, have it built on standards and kind of um, uh, uh, infrastructure that other diseases could use. Um, we uh, used that biobank to, to create lots and lots of opportunities for scientists. We quickly learned that scientists weren't interested in sharing, that the culture of science we were so surprised to find out wasn't one of sharing, wasn't one of collaboration. And so we realized that while most people told us you can't herd cats is what we heard over and over, we said, yes, you can if you move the food. So if the blood and tissue is the food, we're going to move it. We're going to own it. We're going to keep it. We're going to hold it. And we're going to make sure everybody has to come to us and play by our rules, which include sharing and collaborating. So a kind of counterintuitive thing, patenting and looking at creating and owning a resource in order to get the openness and sharing that we wanted. And it worked. So we got a consortium of about 33 scientists worldwide now who all collaborate with each other, who all bring everything to us so that we can facilitate their sharing and moving things forward. We uh, developed a diagnostic test, went on to some clinical trials. And there are some interventions in the disease. We can actually treat a mouse um, and have several knockouts. All of that said, not because that is amazing or interesting or important, but because that's a model um, and only one of many models that are emerging in rare diseases and in common diseases, and that we overlap each other a great deal um, in the process. Go on to uh, genetic alliance. So um, as Rick said in his talk, about uh, 10 years ago or so, I got involved with genetic alliance. One of the first things I did was say, we need to take Rick on as a project. Um, and, and to help pro uh, positive exposure. Um, I, about eight years ago, um, was asked to be the CEO of Genetic Alliance and at the time said, no, I want a world-class leader because this person has to lead all these diseases in all these groups. And the then board of directors was really adamant about my looking in the mirror. And it's one of the greatest acts of humility as a person, I think, to acknowledge that in fact you do have the skills and you do have the, the ability and the vision to lead something like Genetic Alliance, which is absolutely enormous and wonderful. So it's a network of about 10,000 organizations. 1,200 of those are disease-specific organizations. Uh, the rest are universities and hospitals and companies and policy groups, et cetera, uh, law firms, all sorts of groups. Um, it was founded 25 years ago. It's our 25th anniversary year. Um, we're celebrating the entire year. We'll culminate in September with a gallery that Rick's helping us put together of innovators, because we're celebrating innovation. We're really looking at how do you get consumers connected to smart services and that those consumers should be empowered to connect themselves. That's easy in some ways, and it's certainly much easier than it was when in the old days we're you know, trying to hack into libraries or even physically go into libraries. It's easy because we can communicate with each other in much easier ways. But it's ch challenging too because, and you can't, you, know, you really can't read this, um, there are 7,000 genetic diseases, rare diseases. Um, they're, unfortunately, those screenshots, because the, the PowerPoint could actually contain the 35,000 terms that cover those 7,000 rare diseases. Um, I did screenshots, which you can't see. But basically, every single one of these diseases have families, have groups of people attached to them. In the US, the definition is less than 200,000 people in the, in the US 
have to have this disease for it to be classified as an orphan disease, which is an actual legal technical term in the US. In other countries, they use different um, measures for rare diseases, but in all uh, places on the planet, there's been some recognition of rare diseases. So again, no way we can read these 30, 35,000 terms, but we should know that every single one of these um, has people who are affected, who feel really alone, the disease is orphaned, and they themselves feel quite orphaned. So the question is, who are these people? They are millions, hundreds of millions of people around the world. In the US alone, 35 million people have rare diseases. Um, and, and they are people who, I believe, um, are traversing this diagnosed line, coming to stand on the other side of it, and who seek medical services and expect to receive them um, in, the, in their lives. I think, for me, um, the crossing the line was an enormous event. It changed my life, obviously, forever. It changed my husband's. He went on to help found Genomic Health, which is a biotech company, left that and did a consulting gig and is now working for a, a firm in Boston in the health sciences field uh, with his high school degree. Um, but this traverse across this line is very, very significant. And I think every single one of us have an idea of what that feels like. While most people don't have an idea of it in the, in the uh, rare disease world, you have it in other parts of your life, the day before and the day after something that really made a difference in your life. And I think for people who have a disease, and I think this is true for common and rare, you do look at the day that you know uh, you have a symptom and you want the day when you have a health outcome. In between, there are a whole host of things, and we've been hearing about some of those things over the last two days, and they're all important, and each person working on one of these things is looking down their black arrow at the red arrow and sees a piece of the puzzle. But I think what's a special um, and important about those of us who live with the diseases, and again, I think this is all of us, this is not just people with rare diseases, is that we have a perspective and a vision that encompasses that entire line, that whole huge uh, enterprise, and it's not always put together well. Um, Larry put uh, something up here, if we do our parts in fostering the right dialogue, then we can get to this kind of continuum that's in a whole and real way. What do people want? And again, I think I can say this is not only uh, rare, but common as well. And there's all these aspects, and we've been talking about some of them. And essentially, again, we just want to get to health outcomes. We don't really want to know how the sausage is made. We don't really want to be playing in all these different pieces. We want to see the end point. And while we have very good uh, federal funding and biotech funding for various things, it's not well coordinated. We don't learn from our mistakes. We don't share the negative results, et cetera. And that's really disconcerting to those of us who need these health outcomes today. We know that there's huge translational expectations in the public. Again, in the common realm, we've got seen all this, uh, all this media, et cetera. And I think that it's even more true for people with rare diseases. They expect a lot. They expect that we're going to deliver, and I'm saying we, I'm going to say we for a couple reasons, but certainly because I am also now part of the biomedical research enterprise. We have to make a difference. It's often said that what's at stake is bench to bedside, and I would say that's absolutely not true. I think we want to see bench to bedside to practice. The idea that we're going to focus on beds, um, I know my friend Pat Furlong would say, or focus on wheelchairs. You know, yeah, we definitely want things that work and people who have quality of life, but we want them in all aspects of life. And we want to say we want to have things in practice, not just a proof of concept or a simple um, movement or iterative term. We also say we want integration, and we're often given this line, we want phenotype-genotype correlations, and I would say, actually, we do, but that, if we wait until we have phenotype-genotype correlations, we're not gonna be anywhere. We've seen that even in the talks over the last few days. It's great, the stuff we've figured out, but there's a ton more stuff we haven't figured out. And so to wait around to do hypothesis testing, one thing at a time, for those 7,000 diseases that took me a long time to stand here and even flick the slides for, is going to be crazy for us to think we're going to do that as a species even over any kind of real time. So let's use the kinds of things we saw with Jamie Haywood, et cetera. Individuals with diseases want access to services. They want them readily available. They want them integrated and coordinated. They want quality information. And there should be no discrimination whether they have a rare or a common condition, whether they're an underserved community, whether they have insurance or they don't. And we know these issues are pervasive throughout the healthcare system. There's no rare. And there's no other, I'm going to postulate. And this isn't um, something that makes me terribly popular, even in the rare disease community. And my kids have a rare disease, so I 
feel some ability to stand here and say this, but I think in the age of stratified medicine, we're gonna find out everything's rare. So the breast cancer that your 10 neighbors had are 10 kinds of breast, breast cancer, and the diabetes that's in your family is five kinds of diabetes. Um, everything's gonna be rare, and if we don't figure out now how to deal with the rare, the 7,000, that's a limited number of rare diseases, we're not gonna be able to deal with stratified medicine and the common conditions. The, the drug companies know it, the age of the blockbuster is over, they're all opening rare disease divisions. You think they're like saying, oh, we've suddenly got religion about rare diseases? No, they're saying there's actually gonna be money to be made in rare diseases, and I think we need to understand that. All disease is personal, we know that very well. We need uh, to focus on the phenotype and the pathways to map diseases in different ways, to break down the silos, to allow scale and proportion in the regulatory process, that's another whole area we could get into uh, very well to create an even playing field through transparency so that we are sharing resources, data, et cetera, and that we are all responsible. There's no us versus them, there's no bad guys. And I would even say in the disease advocacy community, we have seen us fight with each other. And that is not effective or helpful um, when we pit one, one group against another, even within a disease, even without diseases, and don't understand that we're gonna have to find these solutions together we're all gonna die of old age. Most of us founders are Pat and my age, and I won't give it since, um, <laughs> um, and, and we're not gonna be doing this for another 50 years. So um, we've gotta get smart if we're gonna do anything about it. I won't go through this whole slide. I think many of you have a sense of this. I know the audience is very eclectic, and, and Larry has reminded us that not everybody has the same kind of background here. We all know that we saw early in the 1950s, voluntary health organizations grow up like um, Alcoholics Anonymous and Cystic Fibrosis Foundation and the Tay-Sachs Foundation and really good uh, kind of citizen efforts to do things. And you know that we've seen a real transition over time through all these uh, to the point where in the, t t in, the, in the 2010s, we have organizations like Jamie's, we have organizations um, that are doing interconnective things that are only Facebook organizations, very different than the brick and mortar things that grew up over the last uh, several uh, dozen years, tens of years. Um, I think what we're seeing too is the possibility that disease advocacy as we know it today will not be uh, the disease advocacy we know in 10 years. And I think that's because people who are coming along in this very connected age are not interested in the same way as we were, for example, in finding the next person who had PXE and the next person after that and finding them all by the phone or driving to their state and meeting with them physically. It's so much easier now. When my daughter took over PXE International last September, um, she actually raised $400,000, which I had raised in the previous four years. She raised in four months. And she, had got, she got 400 more people with PXE to join it. Um, that had taken me about a year to get 400 people. So in four months, she did what I did in a year and four years because she's using the tools of this age, Twitter and face, Facebook, et cetera. Um, I think we're gonna see people wanting to be multi-aspected and multi affinity So in other words, before I could say, I belong to the Parent Project Muscular Dystrophy um, Foundation, and I'm proud of that. I'm also gonna say, and I also really like Katy Perry's music, and I really like to go to Tokyo. Um, I'm gonna be okay with having multiple affinities and ways to define myself, unlike in previous generations, I think. I think we're also seeing a real shift in how the world operates, and one that has not yet visited medicine, or bio, bio uh, uh, tech and, and biomedical research. And that is, in the industrial age, we saw control meant production, and in this age, openness means production. Scarcity ruled the day, we're looking at abundance. It, things were hierarchical, you had to have command and control. Uh, network and collaboration, open ideas that just fly around and anybody can use them whenever they want are the, are the name uh, of the game now. Everything was linear and sequential. It had to be because of the ways we had to deliver things, and now it's much more organic. It was a win-lose game. So those two scientists, one from Harvard, one from Mount Sinai, had to fight each other because they had to get a grant from NIH, and the only way to do it, and the only way to get the pu paper published, and the only way to get tenure, the only way to get promoted and was to fight each other. And I think that's still true in the academy, in the academic institutions, and they're way lagging the rest of the world. Uh, everything else is working very much on a win-win basis. There's plenty of stuff, what are we fighting about? If there's 7,000 rare diseases, there's no way that I have to fight with somebody else about what I know and what I don't know. We're all gonna win. 
That's not yet happening in biomedical research. It will be interesting to see if it's overwhelmed by other systems that are actually going to deliver in a different way, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And I think material was important, of course. It was steel, it was cotton, it was paper that was important, and now we know it's information. And information is more abundant uh, than we can possibly say. We've been uh, quoting over and over here, Bruce, Bruce Korff's uh, quote about, will the interpretation cost a million, a million dollars? I don't think so. I think if we use crowdsourcing and citizen scientists and those kinds of correlative kind of build, building infrastructure, it won't cost us that. And that's just a way of us pushing back and saying, ah, we're scared, you know, okay, so what? It's going to cost $1,000 for your genome, but you're still going to need me, the geneticist, or me, the genetic counselor, or me, the disease advocacy group for the interpretation. And I don't think that's true. I think we'll find ways to move around that. Human knockouts, and I have two that I grew up, um, <laughs> blow animal models away. So rare diseases are very good because they give us the ability to study the actual disease quite easily. They're highly penetrant, as Larry said in the first day. Uh, they have an exaggerated phenotype, so they're really, really good for that. They ex excellent pathways models. And in general, we with rare diseases accept risk in its highest form. So while the FDA has a real reason to worry about risk-benefit analysis, and as um, we heard yesterday, 20 drugs were approved and they have to be really careful, um, rare, people with rare diseases are willing to accept a lot of risk because probably they're going to die. Most likely, they'll certainly lose their livelihood, et cetera. As we heard, 80% of these diseases affect children. Uh, a lot can be done if we shift how we think of, of risk and how we think of um, these individuals as, as really good phenotypes for mapping disease in a different way. We've put together some systems approaches, and I'm not going to go through this whole thing either. This is a whole other talk on um, rare disease research and the kinds of parallel pathways we need, that we need this whole social network enterprise to be working and building communities of trust. At the same time, we need small world networks to be working where they work, including academic industry, government, et cetera. We need the utility of the network to be working with the research enterprise and to be building the kinds of things that will get us to the solutions that we need. I published um, this as an example in the PXE strategy in Nature, Genetics, uh, Nature Reviews Genetics in 2007. We've also established a blood and tissue bank that, again, is cross-platform, cross-disease. This, this bank allows everybody who comes into it to use the same templates for all the MTAs, all the consents, all the uh, processing that we need overall. It allows patient enrollment. Everything's web-based. It allows uh, the groups, the disease groups themselves, to manage their resources and to get the cats to be herded again so that they can come together and make a difference in the disease. So the status quo last year, when we have data for last year, is that we spent $600 billion just in the U.S. between the NIH and, and industry, um, and, we, and that's on all conditions, not just rare, and we were able to uh, have 21 therapies approved by the FDA. Anybody who can do that math knows that's a really, really bad equation uh, and that we need something different overall, and I... I uh, have the conjecture that we can actually do something different in rare diseases because less people care. And so we've been doing more rabble-rousing, more kind of disruptive kinds of innovative things because nobody's paying too much attention. If I stood up here and said, I am going to cure cardiovascular disease or, or breast cancer, there would be a lot of people who would throw tomatoes at me. If I'm work, working on, you know, 7,000 rare diseases, hardly anyone wants to throw tomatoes. We're looking at things like this. The drug development process has always been this linear one of, yeah, I can find a, uh, a, an assay, I can do some medicinal chemistry, I can go to some preclinical stuff, I can go into um, some phase one, two, three, and, and sometimes even four. Uh, I can you know, file my IND, all that stuff. Great stuff. And it doesn't work. We're looking now at, so what if we look at this thing in a network model, just like everything else, instead of a linear model? And again, sorry, it's hard to see this, um, but essentially a very big networked model of the drug development process, including various neighbors that are in neighborhoods that are color-coded in different ways, a map that we're about to put up on Genetic Alliance website that has with it every single block interactive to the resources that already exist for you to use, rather than you trying to reinvent the wheel or go through everything again. Again, focus largely on the disease advocacy groups because we're thinking if we can make a difference, if we can change how this is done, then pharma and other, other entities will come along with us. So continuing with the status quo right now will result in many, many more people dying and our loved ones not getting at all what they need. 
I love this quote by Buckminster Fuller. He said, you never change things by, by, by fighting existing reality to change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. So I very much believe that. I very much think that if we tweak this or move that or, you know, and I fought for it, if NIH says we have to put our literature, uh, uh, publicly funded literature into the commons after 12 months, that's all just iterative steps that aren't going to make the difference and that we have to go beyond that. So I think we have to change the paradigm, and we have seen citizens change the paradigm very much. Uh, Egypt, Syria, AIDS, breast cancer, uh, injustice around uh, uh, groups like Amnesty International, the computer industry, music publishing, etc. Most of the time the pushback there is, first of all, those things aren't going to do anything big, and I think at least we've seen with Syria and Egypt, Egypt etc., that there's been big things that have happened because citizens have taken hold of something and said it's really important and we've got to step up. I think we've also seen the paradigms in music and publishing, et cetera, change. And the pushback to me always is, but health is so much more important and it's so much more uh, uh, sacrosanct in the physician and the patriarchal and, uh, and I'm saying, you know what? This is like the most important place for us to take hold of what we should be owning, of what we should be participating in. And I think once we get that as a culture, as a community, uh, big things will happen, very different things. Um, I've just launched a campaign called That's My Data. I wrote a paper in Science um, about how if each of us did say, that's my data, and I want to do something different. What if the entire town of Framingham said, that's my data, and I want it in the commons. I want it open. I want anybody to use it, not just the sponsors, the university who has used it, and not just the deals they've made with various uh, pharma companies. What if we decided we were going to actually participate in owning and moving our own data around? Uh, what about all the data that once a trial is over is sitting there uh, and there's nothing we can do about that? And working with um, Sage Bio Networks and some others in this uh, collaboration. Um, the International Rare Disease Research Consortium with the very horrible acronym ERDIC, um, we established about three or four weeks ago, uh, incentivized by 100 million euros put on the table by the EU Commission, their framework on health. Uh, to look at rare disease research in a global way to stop also funding this project in this country and that project in that country and not having them work together. Uh, funders will enter this project and then the rest of us will work with them to decide what will be done with the money. The money will stay in the countries so people are not worried about kinds of uh, uh, legal issues between the countries but in, it will in, in fact incentivize a lot of movement. China came forward with $100 million, the U U.S. Uh, uh, Canada, Spain, Italy, so we've had some good traction there. And the goals for us are diagnostics for all 7,000 rare diseases by 2020, and the very bold goal that everybody said we were nuts about 200 therapies by the year 2020. So if we had 20 for all diseases last year, we are nuts to say 200, right? If we don't say 200, if we don't put the stake in the sand and say something, then will we do it? We won't. We'll just iteratively move a little by little and we'll die without having made a difference. So I think there's a real citizen's role in uh, biomedical research and in this uh, whole area. And I think it's to change the culture to one of openness and truth. And I think we can do that. We don't have the same kind of constraints on us that academics or, or politicians or uh, government folks um, or industry folks do. We should be building and enrolling in registries, biobanks, and natural history studies immediately, these should be collaborative and cross-conditioned. We should use, network, and improve the existing tools and, and make those better. We should gather researchers, clinicians, and affected families into uh, settings where they can make maps, where they can make uh, cross-conditioned decisions about where we should be putting our resources. And we should be following biological pathways, systems, and physiology uh, like we haven't done before. And we sh ultimately should take ownership of our data and participate uh, in a culture that does that. So I think if we could move the biomedical industry out of the 19th century cottage industry paradigm that it's stuck in, uh, we would invest in the long tail. The long tails worked everywhere. Again, if we had said five years ago or 10 years ago, I stood here and said, everybody in the world can sell the books in their attics and garages together to anybody anywhere else, you'd say, you're nuts. Um, it works. It works really well. Amazon's making tons of money. eBay's making tons of money. Netflix is making tons of money. We should have federated clearinghouses so that we're able to connect all this information across the world. And I think we should be careful not to repeat mistakes or at least mine those mistakes for what they offer. Recognizing pathways in systems biology, understanding the place of epigenetics, 
microbiome, proteomics, and the environment. I think even in rare disease um, entities, we've said, oh, it's Mendelian disorder, it's one gene. We know in families with identical twins, their disease is different. Certainly there's things happening there that we've not begun to understand and we're not paying attention to because we've made genetics so important and so sexy. We should mandate registries so that everybody is enrolled and that they, we understand what we can learn from next-gen sequencing, like the examples we saw yesterday from the Medical College of Wisconsin, et cetera. We should be hy hypothesis generating, not just testing. We should use newborn screening and expand it, uh, integrate it into medical systems. There should be no earmarking for specific diseases, no us versus them. We should require all data and samples prior to phase 2B be pre-competitive. Wouldn't that be crazy? Wouldn't that be bold? Um, let's, let's do that. We have a project actually that we started called Archipelago to Proof of Concept Model, Arch to POCM, that I'm working on with Stephen Friend at Sage Bio Networks, and we've gotten about eight biotech companies to buy into this on a limited basis first to see if it works. And then get rid of the word cure and seek treatments. I think when we say cure, which is impossible, uh, it again keeps us in a place that keeps us um, immobile and we really need to move. I'm going to finish with a quote um, from my daughter and son. We were having dinner um, one day with our friends, uh, Francis Collins and Diane Baker, live near us and have helped um, certainly get us in the early days started in this realm. And we were, you know, having the typical dinner conversation of arguing about or discussing what kinds of things need to be done to transform medicine, et cetera. And our kids at this point, this is 2003, they're like 16 and 14 or something. But my daughter and son said, while you strive to rid the world of genetic diseases, you need to know that we strive to live with it, uh, these genetic diseases. What you define as disease is part of us, is part of who we are and how we see ourselves. We know that even if we are blind at 30 years old, we are still whole and still a complete part of this world. You don't understand the vision this disorder has given us, a view of the purpose of life that you can't understand as long as you fight disease. When you accept that our being affected by PXZ is a gift, that we would not know otherwise, that we would not otherwise have this opportunity to know suffering and the strength it brings, then you will understand your own purpose better. I think at the end of the day, this is about you and me. We represent the whole, we are the whole. There is nothing out there, no other to take care of this. We have to. And that transformation is up to us. So let's build it, let's get it done, let's be the we. Thank you. Um, did you hear me? Yep. Yeah. And uh, it seems that it's fallen off the list of um, things that NIH would like to fund. It's gotten uh, some, a somewhat deservedly bad name, but, but you know, it has, it, it, since a lot of these 7,000 diseases are monogenic, it, it seems to me that it would be worth still investigating how to do this safely and effectively, and I haven't heard very much either from the, the patient organizations or from uh, the science about what the future might be for gene therapy. So, and I'm sure my uh, scientific comrades here can answer, the, answer that scientifically better than I. I can answer it politically and socially. Um, certainly, Jesse Gelsinger's death put a big cold uh, water on that whole area perhaps more severely than it should have. Um, I think, it, you know, again, we, we are, uh, um, whoever yesterday was, was very uh, brilliant about saying we're now in an age where we're trying just not to have lawsuits. Um, you know, when I think the first heart uh, transplant uh, surgeries were done, there were people died. And now people get those quite regularly. Um, and, I, and I'm not at all saying that Jesse should have died for this. Um, but I think what we're, uh, we are seeing is a quiet resurgence of, of gene therapy in not any kind of broad or broadcasted way. The disease groups are certainly asking for it because they usually ask for everything that they can ask for. Um, and I have seen, in fact, NIH start to look at this in some quiet um, uh, uh, workshops, et cetera, to say how can we move forward uh, safely. Mary? Yesterday, Jamie Haywood said, the hell with privacy. We have more important stuff to worry about. 
How do the patient advocacy groups feel about that? So that's a great question, and I'm the person who led the Coalition for Genetic Fairness, which got Gina passed for 12 and a half years. So my feeling about it is that he's, he's largely right, and that the disease advocacy groups would tell you, sure, privacy is important, and particularly for diseases for which there's a stigma. So the Kleinfelters groups and the T Turner syndrome groups, groups that there's a stigma and you don't have that much manifestation. But I would think, you know, Duchenne muscular dystrophy and PXE and all the ones that you're gonna, you know you have this disease and your first priority is going to be treatment, quality of life, w the way you live, et cetera. Privacy is going to be pretty far down the line. I also think privacy is over and we should get over it. Um, when I talk to, and I'm a, a heretic in some circles, uh, you know, particularly ethicists don't agree at all with me, so I should say that. But when I talk to disease advocates or even my own kids or other kids, especially kids with diseases, they say, we don't have privacy anyway. We choose to make everything public. They do in, in Facebook in ways that we, don't, we haven't in previous generations. And so we should just get over that. And what we're more concerned about is technically confidentiality. How can we not abuse the information that we do have? So how are people not discriminated against in work or in, in social kinds of circumstances? Um, so I do think that Jamie is right and that we will find more and more people wanting to aggregate their information publicly if it means we can move the ball forward much more quickly. What's really frustrating to me is watching, so I sit on the, um, as a liaison to the uh, National Human Genome Research Institute Council, and I watch the parade of scientists say, no, we didn't start our project that you funded 18 months ago, because the IRB won't allow it, because it's using whole genome sequencing, and the, the sequence is, is an identifier. That gets to be a little crazy, in, in, in a sense. And then meanwhile, you have people like Latonya Lato Sweeney and um, Homer and others showing that you can actually identify people from this. And then I want to say, uh, so what? You know, what, what's going to happen to you if you get identified via your sequence? So I, I agree largely with Jamie, and I think the disease groups do for the most part, with the exception of the ones that, for which there is stigma. Hello? Oh, there. Uh, I was at a conference earlier this week where Anish Chopra, the Chief Technology Officer of the United States, uh, talked about the effort to make vast amounts of government data publicly available for mining and research. And I wondered if your organizations are working in collaboration with that in any way. Yeah, so I had the good fortune of three years ago being chosen to be one of the 20 people that sit on the HIT standards group, which Anish uh, chairs. Uh, and John Halamka from uh, Harvard and some others. And so we're working really hard on what it means for us to, one, get the standards and the policies we need to be able to do that, and two, then what's the social cultural change that needs to happen. And again, what we keep finding is we are not finding it in the disease groups, and then the people say to me, well, that's because they're not the general public, and the general public has much greater fears, back to your, uh, your statement. What we're finding is the general public doesn't have much greater fears either. Um, what does happen, though, are the kind of uh, crazy, um, and I'm belying my uh, prejudice, of course, um, media kinds of assaults on privacy. So, for example, the storage of blood spots uh, and the use of them in the United States. There's been lawsuits in six or seven states, all led by one woman who believed that, in fact, we're invading our newborn's privacy by storing and using those blood spot samples. Um, in Texas, they destroyed five million of those because of four families that she got to sue the state. Um, so we are working really hard to help change the culture and to help educate the public. Uh, we have a website launching later this year called My Genes, My Health that will start to educate the public about these issues, um, believing that Anish is right and that the more data that's public, the more interactions between those data, both in cyberspace and in people's hands, the bigger difference we'll be able to make. Uh, question up here uh, in the back. Uh, yes, uh, I, I wanted to ask something that may not be real popular, but um, th there's been these great talks on citizen empowerment and citizen involvement like Jamie's talk and all the others. Um, but I, for the last 10 years, I've been involved with the attacks on mainstream science in fields like evolution and climate science, and those attacks are being staged by citizens as well. Um, so I just wonder, is there any downside to empowering all the citizens in these different topics? <laughs> Yeah, you know, Jamie has patients like me. We should have citizens like me. Um, yeah, we, um, yeah, there's definitely a danger. Um, I think it's back to this dialogue stuff on the on the poster here. 
uh, we've got to figure out how to have that dialogue. Uh, that when we do have dialogues, and I've had the good fortune of, for example, going into communities where evolution was uh, banned, uh, when we have the conversation, uh, things move a little. And I think those kinds of conversations are going to take some time. I think we also have a country where a lot of people believe in evolution, want biomedical research to move forward, but we don't get off our butts and do anything about it. And again, what happens is the people who kind of get um, really passionate about something like blocking evolution from being taught in schools or blocking blood spot use in states um, are able to pick up a lot of traction, particularly in the media. It's not so sexy to stand up and say, I think evolution's right and should be taught in schools. That's not going to get in the New York Times. Or to say, uh, yeah, we should have biomedical research go forward. Instead, if I say, the, D the government has my baby's DNA and is cloning my baby, then I get in the, in the press. So, and I'm not slamming the press completely either. I, you know, I think it's a sensational nature. So my wish would be that we get a better dialogue with many more citizens who get that, you know, if we went home this afternoon, all of us, and told our next door neighbor that how they uh, interacted with science, with the university, with their doctors would make a difference in how their next generation would be treated in terms of having treatments, um, they'd be pretty surprised that they could have any effect um, whereas people who have a cause like abolishing evolution uh, from the classroom um, know they can have a, an effect. I think the rest of us don't often see that being empowered would make a difference. We take a huge risk when we do it, and I do believe there's no us versus them. So I want to have that conversation even amongst people who disagree and who might be dangerous on the way. I think we'll get to the right answer because I, I have an, a fundamental belief that we, we are good as a species, and we do want the best, especially for future generations. Thank you.